Good afternoon. My name is Ramona Tanabe with WCRI, and this is our last session of the first day of the WCRI Annual Issues and Research Conference. Today we have an interesting panel to give us their perspectives on how all the system stakeholders are faring the day-to-day -day work in the midst of a pandemic. Our panelists today are Director James Ashley from the Industrial Commission of Arizona, Stephanie Bloomingdale, the President of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO, Libby Christman, the Vice President for Risk Management and Safety from Ajo Del Hayes, USA, and Catherine Miller, Professor at the University of Colorado and the former Medical Director for the Division of Workers' Compensation in Colorado. So we have a broad representation of stakeholders here on our panel. And can each of you take a minute or two and tell us how COVID has changed the role within your organization? We'll start with you, Director Ashley. Thank you very much, Ramona. And I appreciate this opportunity to be able to share our Arizona experience and our agency experience during the pandemic. At the Industrial Commission, we like to be driven by data and statistics and trends. So we view WCRI as a very good partner and a very good resource as well. And we hope, and we hope to be able to welcome you to Phoenix in the not too distant future for an in-person conference. We look forward to that. The Industrial Commission of Arizona was founded in 1925 just a few years after the last pandemic. So we can't say the agency has been through this before. And I'd say the number one change has been telework by employees out of necessity. And our employees have done a great job of transitioning to significant levels of teleworking, all while maintaining 100% of agency functions and also high levels of responsive customer service in every division. Employees who had never teleworked before not only in their current position, but in any job they ever had. They became pros. Over the course of just about a week or two at the beginning of the pandemic, we moved a significant number of employees to telework. We either had to modify or create how-to guides for remote work and make sure employees had the tools and the direction they needed, as well as maintaining high levels of IT security. Knowing that employee engagement could be a challenge, we even created a, a popular employee blog called On the Brighter Side it's where employees share their positive experiences with telework. And over time, as you can imagine, we learned a lot about everybody's pets. And in Tucson and Phoenix, in both our Phoenix and Tucson offices, we put in, in strict COVID mitigation efforts at both of our buildings. I do really miss employee appreciation events, pizza parties, ice cream socials, auditorium gatherings, and recognitions of staff. And employee engagement is very important. So we've done things such as hold virtual contests between divisions for a little bit of levity. New employee onboarding, as you can imagine, is very critical and important when so many people are working remotely. So we go out of our way to make sure those new employees feel welcome. In terms of retirement celebrations, they look a lot different when they're virtual and we've had a couple of those as well. And every agency in Arizona is deploying the Arizona management system. That's lean management with metrics, goals, and glide paths. And it also consists of performance huddle boards in every division. And those huddle boards are all virtual now, and the team has done a really good job with that as well. Stakeholder engagement, while we can't fill our conference rooms or auditorium with stakeholders to discuss important issues, those are all virtual. And in a sense, when you don't have to account for drive time to and from meetings that are offsite, can actually fill the day with even more meetings, which has some advantages as well. But our main focus was just to maintain high levels of agency performance, and that's by continuing to fulfill our ICA mission and responsibilities, something that's even more important in a remote environment. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie. Hi there. Uh, my name is Stephanie Bloomingdale, and I'm the president of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO, and I'm also uh, the chair of the labor side of our worker comp advisory committee. And I'd like to thank the WCRI for uh, many, many decades of high quality research uh, that we use to help us uh, to craft um, uh, better uh, worker comp laws in Wisconsin. So I thank you and everyone uh, from the WCRI uh, for the great work that you do. Um, you ask how, how my, my work has changed, how our work has changed uh, due to the pandemic. And I will say that um, immediately there was an, an immediate turn. Uh, this wasn't a gradual change. This was um, really a, a, what do you call a, a hairpin turn. 
because we were uh, singly focused on workplace safety um, for uh, the people that are our members and everyone that works for a living. Because in the beginning uh, of this pandemic, there was little understanding of what needed to be done, unfortunately. Uh, really because there was no OSHA infectious disease standard in the United States. And so that left uh, employers, it left employees without a guide uh, to, uh, to, in terms of what to do. So um, that really became our, our, uh, our, our mission to uh, work with um, our government, uh, to work with uh, our, our, our workers, employers, to make sure that work places were as safe as they could be. Um, and we'll talk about that. I know later you have some other questions about that. But when it comes to how, how we change as an organization, um, of course, you know, there's a lot of, you know, cancel, cancel, cancel of, uh, you know, conference after conference and figuring out how to do all of that remotely. But the biggest change was the focus. Um, you know, we've always focused on physical injuries at work, but not as much on the infectious disease. And so that really became uh, the priority of the Wisconsin AFL-CIO to, uh, to, to, to work on safety in the workplaces, not only for our members and the workers, but also for all of society, because you can't have a, uh, you can't beat this pandemic without having safe work workplaces. Thank you. Libby? Hi, thank you, Ramona. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so our company, Ajo Del Hayes USA, we operate uh, five major grocery chains uh, on the East Coast. And as you can imagine, grocery stores and grocery store workers became absolutely essential workers at the beginning of the pandemic and remaining um, just because we needed to be open to service our customers. And if I take a look at you know how the pandemic you know may have changed our role in the organization, I, I wouldn't say it changed anything because I have responsibility for all of our associate safety. Um, we also have responsibility for claims handling, uh, especially workers' compensation claims handling within our organization. And so we, we really just ramped up our, our focus um, through our crisis management team, which really helped to deploy a lot of these safety measures that we needed to implement as soon as possible. And certainly to really you know, kind of build on what Stephanie already said is our associate safety um, was absolutely critical because and we weren't really just taking a look at safety specifically for our associates. We were also inviting the public to come into our stores. So it was really about, you know, how do we make sure that we have the right uh, procedures and policies in place and guidance for our associates, but also what did customers need to do when they also came into our retail locations? Because you know that was a very different situation than you know in you know workplaces where there might not have been a customer element you know kind of coming into the stores. And so certainly, I mean, we took a look at everything from CDC guidance. We also had um, our own medical expertise that we tapped into to help deploy uh, a multitude of safety measures. Um, but I hate, I don't think it necessarily things changed for us. I think we just had a new focus and certainly one that we needed to learn very quickly. Thank you. And Catherine. Thank you for including me. Um, I think what Libby just brought up was a big change for the physicians just in terms of, of volume. And so while occupational clinics do always focus on how to help employers with safety and how do we make both, as you pointed out, the workers and clients safe, this turned out to be a real challenge because things were changing every day, as you know. So the CDC sometimes was saying one thing, then we say, oh, we look at Europe, no, maybe we should be doing this. And so to try and really make sure that we were giving the best advice and providing the best safety measures for the workers was took up much, much time compared to what uh, we usually were devoting to that. And then I think the other big change, um, as you know, was the telehealth. And while we were had telehealth before, and we do think it's quite successful in, in many situations, it, there's still even now some uh, reluctance to consider that as being a, how you handle an entire claim. Most, I think, the physicians and patients feel a little uncomfortable with not having the personal touch and not being able to talk to a patient 
um, in person where the communication is, you know, just you feel a little better and you feel like the there might be better uh, understanding and rely, the patient might feel more comfortable really as long as there wasn't a safety issue. So of course, those are big issues for the clinics, when to open up. M many of them remained open during a lot of it, but there were a lot of safety measures required. Uh, so I think those are the, the two biggest issues for the, the providers. And of course, I do want to say thank you to all of the healthcare workers out there who risked their families and their own lives and continually did so when we didn't even know or have the proper equipment some of the time. So we, are, we are certainly, um, have to say thank you to all those people who were out there with our patients. Thank you, Catherine. Next, I'd like to hear from you about how technology has played a role in meeting the needs of the injured workers and what obstacles have you run into? Libby, could you take that one? Sure. Um, you know, I think if, if we just think about sort of the progression of what happens to you know, an associate that gets hurt on the job, you know, the, the first part is really getting them appropriate medical treatment. Um, so our company does use um, nurse, a nurse, a telephonic nurse triage program, and we've been doing that for a very long period of time. And, and we do like that option because it does give our associates the ability to talk to a nurse on the telephone immediately. Um, but the second thing that, that we initiated, and we had been doing this, um, sort of initiating this prior to the pandemic, uh, but was, is telemedicine and telehealth, and how do we have the ability to have our injured associates being able to get medical um, evaluation, you know, in a, in a better way, because, you know, as Catherine indicated, a lot of the clinics were closed or our associates really were not comfortable you know, going into a physician's office. And so telehealth really did give us a, a really viable option for people to be seen. Um, and a lot of associates did like it. You know, I think once they got over the, uh, you know, I think some of the challenges of you know, downloading an app and you know, some of those things that they weren't accustomed to. Um, you know, I think that, you know, some of the, um, some of the other things that, you know, we looked at from a technology standpoint, um, you know, certainly workers' compensation hearings, um, you know, having those being done virtually was helpful because the alternative when they're not, when they're not holding anything in person, it could have been significant delays. Um, so I think that having some of those mediations and conferences and conciliations in a virtual way. Um, you know, had also been, have also been helpful. Um, I think some of the other things that we took a look at um, that were helpful to us, you know, which might seem somewhat um, kind of, uh, I would say simplistic, but even just the ability to text um, injured workers. I mean, typically we're trying to get in touch with people by telephone um, or via mail. And you know the options of being able to text people, I think, was very simple, and it was also clear that uh, people got messages right away. We were able to text reminders for doctor's appointments, and so I think that I mean some of those things were very, very helpful for us. Thank you, Director Ashley. Would you like to address what kind of technology Arizona has implemented? Uh, yes, I would. Thank you. And, and I'll speak to this from our perspective at the Industrial Commission administering the state's workers' compensation system. An advantage that we had was our focus before the pandemic on online services and modernizing our agency IT systems to help everyone that interacts with, uh, with us have a better experience. For example, we replaced a 1991 COBOL MS-DOS system in our claims division. The new system allows integrated process flows, electronic files, and document generation. And it also eliminated the manual document creation processes that really slowed our claim staff down. Customers don't see this part, but what they do experience is something we call the ICA community. The ICA community, it's a web-based, account-based portal. It's where stakeholders and injured workers have the ability to view claim files, hearing files. They can upload documents, view a hearing calendar, or change how they receive correspondence. And adjusters and attorneys can receive a daily email with all the documents added to a file that they've subscribed to as an interested party. It really enables the customers to have access and submit and receive information quickly and easily. Prior to the pandemic, we also turned all of our forms at the agency into online, billable, and submittable forms for every function. And we revamped portions of our website with new content as well. 
And when it does come to our administrative law judge hearings, the state was actually in the process of migrating away from Microsoft to G Suite. So we had Google Meets fully operational when the pandemic happened. So the community and our staff were able to quickly transition from in-person to fully remote hearings. An obstacle was unrepresented claimants without access to computers or webcams. I wanted to make sure that we weren't depriving anyone of, of an opportunity to participate in a virtual hearing. So we set up a special room at the agency with a computer with a, web, a webcam to be able to accommodate injured workers that didn't have access to technology so that they could participate in these remote hearings. And that was something very important. It's actually been used since the start of the pandemic. It's been used over 65 times by injured workers that don't have access to technology so they can participate in those remote hearings. Um, we also received help from one of Governor Doug Ducey's executive orders. It was issued under the Public Health State of Emergency. It was titled Increased Telemedicine Access for Workers' Compensation. It required all work comp insurance plans regulated by the state to provide coverage for all healthcare services that could be provided through telemedicine if it would be covered as an in-person visit. It included all electronic means of delivering healthcare, including telephone and video calls. It did allow for exceptions in cases of suspected fraud. Our fee schedule, it already authorized telehealth were covered under the law. The executive order expanded use to include physical therapists and occupational therapists since that was previously prohibited from being done remotely. We also adopted new medical reimbursement codes for electronic services and added codes for COVID testing and also to support telehealth. It was essentially a lot of the actions we had already taken at the agency, which allowed us to transition easier into the world of the pandemic from a technology standpoint. Thank you very much. In addition to um, CDC guidelines, many workplaces have also added additional safety measures. Stephanie, can you s describe how you've seen this develop? Um, so the question is um, beyond the CDC guidelines um, or OSHA standards. You're saying that are there other uh, 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 guidelines that have been put in place by employers, correct? Could you restate the question? Sorry. Yes, other safety measures that have been put in place by workplaces. Well, um, really, I want to go back to um, the fact that when the pandemic hit, there were no OSHA guidelines for infectious diseases. And so that was um, a real problem for employers, a real problem for employees, and a great problem for the public. And so we saw in the beginning um, of the pandemic in March, well, I don't know if you want to call it the beginning, but when it was uh, declared the pandemic, we saw um, some, some, pretty, some pretty bad things happening. Um, there were some employers that actually said to employees, don't wear a mask because you're going to scare the customer. Um, and we saw uh, that along with the CDC, who also at that time said, don't wear a mask unless you yourself are sick. And so there were some real problems early on, um, but what we saw with, uh, with more information and with um, employers and organizations pushing them like the Wisconsin AFL-CIO and the AFL-CIO nationally is that uh, uh, standards became more prevalent. So like in the rest, in the uh, grocery industry, we saw that a lot. Um, and Libby talked about that uh, from her perspective. And we saw plexiglass go up. We saw limiting the number of customers in the store. We saw, you know, uh, 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 employees needing to wear masks and social distancing. And so while we lost some real time in the beginning, uh, we, saw, we saw it ramping up over, over time. Um, and I do think that uh, it is important to note that lack of that o o OSHA infectious disease standard. We still don't have one uh, to this day. It did not get passed in the most recent um, stimulus bill. It did, um, there is an executive order and the CDC has issued guidelines, but they haven't put those into, um, uh, you know, into, into law yet. So, um, well, we did see, um, you know, really employers and employees coming together and especially in areas where 
the, uh, the employer had uh, a unionized workforce where they had already had safety committees, they could come together to implement uh, safety measures we saw in a much quicker way. Thank you. Libby, as an employer, uh, what types of additional safety measures have you implemented? Yeah, so I think, you know, other than sort of, I'll call it the standard things that, uh, you know, I think you can see, um, certainly the plexiglass and the mask, social distancing, you know, all were done. You know, we also found some more unique ways to remind certainly our customers about the significance of social distancing. And we did um, these little vests that associates would wear. And on the back of them, it was a reminder that you need to stay six feet um, apart. So again, it was almost like a walking sign with associates that, again, just a more reinforcement for customers about you know, keeping, you know, keeping their distance as well. Um, you know, some of the other things we did that I, I think were quite unique, um, we, we have implemented um, certainly like health assessments for temperature taking and, and symptoms in, in all of our locations. We, we've also been piloting and quite a few uh, technologies like robots that do sanitizing within distribution centers. Um, we also developed our own application, our own internal application where we have been able to track any type of COVID event across all of our companies and, and our associates, things like how many people are quarantined and, you know, and how many people may have had a spouse that had COVID. That way we were able to really track what were some of these exposures going on to our associates. And we also developed some pretty significant contact tracing, um, a multi-page document that any associate that either had symptoms or tested positive, that we would go through this contact tracing by our human resources department so that we would make sure that anyone that may have had any kind of close proximity would be quarant you know, would have to quarantine and not be in the workplace. And I think that was really important, number one, as a visibility that associates understood that we're taking this seriously and we really do want to have that pr those prevention efforts. And part of that is really excluding people that had clo close contact. Um, as well as a lot of certainly overall communication um, within, the, within the company. I mean, we have a cross-functional uh, crisis management team, which was meeting on a daily basis. Now we are continuing to meet at least on a weekly basis. And we talk about everything that's going on within all of our organizations so that we can share with each other, but also have a good understanding of, you know, what we take a look at from a risk standpoint. You know, and I think some of the other things that we did, um, just, you know, air filtration changes, a lot of, you know, sort of a lot of maintenance changes, again, to make sure that facilities were as safe as they could be, in, you know, really in the midst of uh, a lot of the unknown. Thank you very much. You know, re returning to work is always a priority for a worker who's experienced a workplace injury. What challenges have each of you seen in the past year about returning injured workers to work and what, what do you think we can expect going forward? Catherine, can we start with you? Yeah, so I think that um, fortunately we have much better information than we have when we started out. And so um, what the CDC has recently recommended, I think is very consistent with um, all of the studies out there um, from various places, including NFL studies and other things where we really got to look at uh, how communicable was it in different situations. So right now, um, if you've had uh, symptoms, if you're 10 days without symptoms and you don't have a fever, as long as you're not taking any uh, medication to decrease your fever for 24 hours and your symptoms have decreased. Now you notice I didn't say gone, they decreased. Uh, then you can go back. And for isolation, it also helps a lot because now we have just the seven days if you have a test at five days, assuming that you don't have any symptoms. So assuming no symptoms, seven days, test at five. All of that is consistent with all the literature we are now seeing because testing between two and seven and seven days at the outset is, but usually around five, it has the best results. Because otherwise, as you may know, testing is sometimes uh, a falsely negative. So, so this is very consistent. I think it helps get people back into the workplace and functioning uh, again. And I think we're going to talk later about symptoms that might persist. So I'll leave that alone for right now. <laughs> okay, thank you. Director Ashley, um, what challenges have you seen returning injured workers to work? Um, 
Yeah, in terms of the challenges in the, in the past year and the importance of return to work, I'll speak to this from the perspective of our special fund division, that's our division paying benefits to uninsured claimants. And we all know that successful return to work approaches are important for the injured worker, for their, their health and well being. It's, it's one of the reasons we previously adopted the treatment guidelines to ensure the best and most appropriate treatment for injured workers and importantly to address concerns of opioid overprescribing and abuse. Some of the challenges the, the special fund saw this past year in claimants returning to work included physicians offices closing and not being equipped right away for telemed, office visits, physical therapy visits, diagnostic studies and surgeries were canceled and IMEs weren't being scheduled. And this was mostly in the mid to late March through April, May, June timeframe of last year. Some claimants had a fear of attending in-person appointments when they were being held again. And we had some claimants who tested positive for the virus and some that were exposed or possibly exposed so they couldn't schedule an appointment or they had to cancel their already scheduled appointments. All of these circumstances caused some delays in treatment which also delayed the claimants being able to return to work. Another issue we saw was if the claimant was on a modified work status, in some cases they weren't able to return to their place of employment or, or look for other employment due to shutdowns. Um, while, you, while some claimants could clearly transition back to work by telecommuting for their jobs, you of course had issues of employees and professions where they couldn't telework. And that was an important issue or there might've been COVID related interruptions in their employer's operations. I will point out that the essential services and businesses designated by the governor helped minimize the impact by allowing a lot of workers to safely return to work. But we look forward to continuing our vocational rehab program at the special fund to make sure we can help workers transition into other areas of employment when necessary, um, whether related to the pandemic or not. And that's also critical to help them return to work. Thank you. Stephanie? Hi, thank you. Um, well, we are in Wisconsin very proud that we have a very short, uh, in terms of the stacked up against the rest of the country, return to work. And we, 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 we believe that is because of um, a lot of the work that we do on the Worker Comp Advisory Committee and our, our, our long um, really uh, goal of getting people back to work very quickly. Um, how it relates to COVID is a bit complex because of the presumption standard. So in Wisconsin, we had a, the Governor Evers, our Governor Evers did put a presumption standard into um, public safety workers early on. And so that was there so that if, if they were uh, contracted, COVID on the, contracted COVID on the job, it was presumed that they would be, um, have access to worker comp. That was quickly overturned by the, uh, at the insistence of the Republican legislature um, to our state uh, Supreme Court. So we didn't have a presumption standard for, um, for really anyone then, not even the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, emergency workers. And so in the early days of COVID, we did see uh, many healthcare workers that, that had contracted COVID were, um, it was accepted and they were treated under the worker comp system. But because there was no standard, because there was no law on, on this, what ended up happening is as uh, after people were making claims, they were being denied because it was viewed that they it was part of community spread and they couldn't link it to the em employer, uh, uh, to their work, to their work. So that really was a gap in the, um, in our worker comp system and really should be looked at um, for the, for the future. Thank you very much. And Libby. So across all of our companies, we have a pretty good return to work program. You know, we offer all kinds of, you know, light and modified duty. And the one thing that we did find that was difficult to get some of our injured workers back to work was, um, you know, the lack of, uh, medical accessibility, especially for people who, you know, who had been off work for a period of time um, or for associates that were actually in need of surgery. So things like medical offices being closed, which has been mentioned previously. Um, and then in many of the states where we operate, you know, surgery, you know, sort of, you know, certain non-emergency surgeries were, were postponed. So we did have, you know, so we did have associates that really just could not 
return to work um, until some of those services were um, available. Now, the one thing that we did find though is because we do have a pretty rigorous return to work program, we actually found some of the opportunities for really, you know, either whether more sedentary or light work actually increased in our retail locations because of some of the things that we were doing, like some of the occupancy standards or occupancy limits, um, reinforcement for customers to wear masks that we would have associates stationed, you know, in front of a store or helping to, you know, work with customers on some of those guidelines that we had in our stores. And so it did give us an opportunity to bring people who wanted, who, you know, who wanted to come back to work, some of those opportunities. And we also did have some associates that were a little bit concerned about not being able to, um, you know, go back into the workplace just because of the fear of, of COVID. Um, but we certainly tried to bridge the gap for all those associates that, you know, were able to come back to work in a light duty capacity um, and making sure that we were able to accommodate those. Thank you. We're, we're seeing a lot of workplaces reopen in various stages across the country. And there appears to be a renewed interest in remote or hybrid workforce. What cautions might employers and workers keep in mind for these scenarios? Director Ashley? Oh, thank you. There's a, there's a telework culture that's really developed over the course of the last year. Before the pandemic, I'd say many people had a certain opinion of telework, including myself. That may have changed somewhat over the last year. For state employees in Arizona, the state is actually creating a long-term detailed plan and structure to maximize telework opportunities for each state agency into the future. It's called Arizona's Connected Workforce. And one of the first things they did was poll every state employee about their views on telework. And what they found when it comes to the pros and the cons, the pros of, of telework were time and gas money saved in commuting, better work-life balance, and the ability to focus better without workplace distractions. And among the cons were feeling disconnected from colleagues, not having the necessary hardware or connectivity issues, and additional family members at home. Although I guess, depending on the employee in the day, they might consider additional family members at home a pro or a con. Either way, we had over 76% of state employees that viewed telework as an employee benefit and understanding that not all employees can telework. The goal of Arizona's Connected Workforce is to focus on best practices for managing and coaching for performance in telework environments and to provide guidance on policy updates, performance metrics, implementation, and even handling equipment and office supply issues. The state views work trends impacting the private sector as applicable to the public sector as well. And prior to COVID-19, about 6% of state employees recorded about one day of telework a week. That changed to about 43%, but that doesn't take into account agencies that are very large that do not have a, a workforce that can telework, like our Department of Corrections, our Department of Public Safety, our State Department of Transportation. And when it comes to safety, safety is a concern in any work environment, including at home. And I wanna make sure employees are safe, whether they're working at home or the agency, where, as I mentioned earlier, we've implemented stringent COVID mitigation efforts. And we've also achieved federal OSHA voluntary protection program status for the agency as well. Our staff from the Industrial Commission, they actually led the safety focus of the Arizona Connected Workforce documents. And we created training documents on the basics of home office safety. And at the agency, we've even let employees take ergonomic office chairs home, and we even created a home safety checklist for each teleworking employee. Another focus is training of new employees. That's very important in training them on an ever-improving safety culture. Employers will need to balance performance, accountability, communication, which is really key, and safety. And with a safety culture and a, and a work culture in general, it's, it's all about continual improvement, feedback, and sustaining success. Thank you very much. Um, Libby, is there something from an employer perspective that you can add to that? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, you know one of the things that we've learned. So most of our employees work in a work in you know a grocery store, distribution centers, or drivers. 
Um, but we do also have a large uh, corporate uh, workforce as well. And, and certainly I think the significance of, of making sure that people understand, you know, the ergonomics of, you know, how people sit and, and comfort. And so, you know, providing, you know, some of those materials, we certainly did that when we sent uh, all of our associates home, um, you know, similar to what James had said. I think the other piece too that we've learned is that the opportunity for people to connect is really important. You know, and I think when people are isolated and working at home, it does become very hard to feel, have that, you know, kind of connected purpose with what you do along with your teammates. And so I think the opportunity to build in ways that people can have some of that informal conversation, chats, call it, call it, you know, having coffee with, you know, with one of your colleagues it can be overlooked. And but the significance of that is really about that overall well-being. And I think that's that is really vital to people feeling good at work and certainly not only being productive, but having a connected purpose. And so I think that as we talk about, you know, the, the important things about, you know, the safety elements, I think another safety element is certainly that connectedness and uh, making sure that people have plenty of opportunity to do that. One thing that we learned is when associates went home to work is people were working more. Um, because, you know, if your laptops, if your laptops open, um, it, you know, it's always in front of you and you may be working more hours um, and certainly saw that from from my team in safety, you know, who were not only in the field, but also at, at home. And there really needs to be the reminder as well is that hey, just because you're at home doesn't mean that you need to be working 24 seven. And sometimes it's very, these very simple reminders so that people keep that type of separation between that workspace as well as their home space. That's a good reminder. And finally, um, do you foresee a change in the length of time that claims remain open? Catherine, let's start with you. Uh, yes, I think this is becoming much clearer from the most recent studies that have looked at um, patients as far out as nine or 10 months. And so if you look back in with the flu or with SARS, we did always see a certain percentage of patients who did have some sort of permanent or very long standing uh, physiologic problem. But the numbers here are much higher than we would expect. So from one of the most recent studies, it was a little less than one in five of non-hospitalized non patients who had significant changes on their pulmonary function tests. Now that's not something we really expected, right? So we, we figured that hospitalized patients would have higher numbers. And for hospitalized patients who are on high flow oxygen, it's 56% of patients have a pulmonary function test less than 80% for their diffusing capacity. Uh, so these are really significant changes. Now, as you know, there's a whole myriad of things that you can get. So um, you can have strokes, you can have myocardial damage. We still don't really extend the extent of that. They just had one on athletes, which fortunately showed less damage than we thought because we have seen a few case reports, right, where there was myocardial damage um, unexpected uh, from people who maybe weren't even hospitalized. Uh, so unfortunately, the, the number of organs that can be affected is very is significant. And so we are definitely going to see some long term claims as well as mind you claims of people who probably didn't submit a claim. So they were asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic. Um, they maybe just never reported anything. Um, they might even not have been tested, which is a whole other problem in workers comp, which I have a whole lecture on how do you decide what to do with those. But um, so we really do have an issue here that's going to be interesting to um, follow long term. Now, I think you also know that fatigue is one of the most common complaints, right? However, fatigue is like um, saying something hurts. It's meaningless. So um, you're going to see, I believe, very significant medical workups. And I expect that you should see medical workups on people when you get to somewhere between four and six months and they are not functioning normally and you don't have other obvious reasons, like I said, maybe the pulmonary function or something like that. And you're gonna to have to do a myriad of workups because we have already found other you know, unusual diseases not being diagnosed. So posterior orthostatic tachycardia syndrome um, 
is one that you don't see normally very often. So all these things are going to have to be ruled out. And then, of course, we do have the brain fatigue uh, issue. And if you've ruled out all of those things I'm talking about, then you would probably be doing some type of neuropsych testing to see what else might be involved. So these are going to be very complicated cases, and they are going to require significant medical workup. Thank you. Stephanie, is there something you'd like to add to that? Um, you know, it, uh, it, what Catherine has talked about is really sort of the unforeseen um, long-term effects of COVID that were not known uh, initially. And so initially people thought that this was going to be, you know, like a flu and it would start and it would end and, and people would move on. And so this is very concerning, um, the mixture of having this long haul syndromes that Catherine described uh, mixed with this lack of presumption uh, with the worker comp system. So I think we're gonna see some real challenges when it comes to claims remaining open, uh, when, it remain, when it comes to people filing claims uh, later. So we are going to see um, some big challenges ahead for the worker comp system related to COVID. Thank you, Stephanie. And thank you to each of our panelists for participating in our discussion today. Thank you everybody for, for joining us here for our question and answer session. We have a few questions to um, reach out here. Um, were there issues with availability of personal protective equipment for workers? Stephanie? Hi, thank you. Um, so you're asking if there were issues with delivering uh, personal protective equipment to frontline workers and there, there, there were many issues. Um, I want to like just take your mind back to last February, March, April. Um, right now, you look around and there's a mask everywhere you go. Um, but at that time, there were not masks. And uh, really, uh, I think it's important to look at this because, frankly, America failed frontline workers in this pandemic in the beginning. And in order to do <laughs> To fix the problems, we have to be honest about where we fell short. And so you might ask, why? why? Why didn't we have simple masks? Why didn't we have simple PPE? Well, it goes back to our uh, supply chain. And our supply chain in America is broken. Uh, 20 years ago, 80% of PPE was made in the United States of America. Now, 80% of PPE is, is made outside of the United States. And when the pandemic hit, our largest supplier was China. Well, they needed that PPE themselves. And so it was not coming into this country. And so what happened was workers were left exposed, workers died needlessly, uh, and spread the, spread the disease because at that time, there was a lot of monkeying around talking about, uh, was this, aerosol or was it droplets? Did we need gloves? Did we need masks? So it was very frustrating um, to be, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, AFL-CIO, which we are an organization that our, our mission is to protect workers, but we had nurses wearing garbage bags because they didn't have gowns. And this is shameful, should never happen again. Um, and we need to change that just-in-time supply model that we have. Uh, we should have adequate stockpiles of, of, of PPE. And um, really what happened is, and some employers were very good, some were very good, but others were absolutely negligent. And because we don't have an infectious disease standard, there weren't rules uh, for, the, for the road. But what we did was uh, here at the Wisconsin AFL-CIO, is when we saw there were no masks for our fellow workers, uh, union workers launched the Union Mask Brigade. And this was workers helping workers. Um, when we launched the brigade, uh, really it was everybody joining together. Some people sewed masks, some people donated uh, fabric, some people delivered the masks. But really it was when industry failed, when government failed, workers stepped up. Uh, and uh, we are we are proud of that, but it is just a uh, an instance of 
really looking at what, what we could have done better and being prepared for the future. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next question is for Director Ashley. Is there any intention to retain some form of virtual platform for hearings? Thank you, Ramona. That's a good question. We've all learned so much during the pandemic of what works well and, and maybe what could use some improvement. We have 18 administrative law judges with 15 in Phoenix and three in Tucson with a geographic split of cases and hearings with roughly about 5,000 hearings every year. And I can see a, a hybrid scenario in the future with a substantial number of hearings still being conducted remotely with initial hearings among the most likely to be held in person. An advantage of remote hearings for everyone involved, um, that would include applicants out of state, claims adjusters appearing from out of state, um, further hearings for medical witnesses since they already often appeared by phone. We use a Google Meets system and that's our platform. So it's very easy to share documents on the screen. So that works out really well in hearings. And I could see individual hearings with a mix, a mix of some parties in person in the hearing room and some parties remote. And the remote parties will be using our large live screen or life size um, the screens that we have in a couple of hearing rooms that works out really well to to make it a, a very good process and a very good feeling for those that are participating remotely. When it comes to our out of town hearings before the pandemic, we had about half a dozen locations around the state to serve the rural parts of Arizona, where we would hold out of town hearings and I could see returning to some of those um, when appropriate. But I could also see a lot of those now being held remotely and that's actually going to be easier to schedule for all parties involved. And one thing I had mentioned earlier in terms of the special room we have at the agency in Phoenix and Tucson for specifically unrepresented claimants who don't have access to technologies with a computer and a webcam, we're going to keep that room and we're going to continue to utilize that when folks don't have access to technology. And for unrepresented claimants or others without access to technology in, in other parts of the state in rural areas, I could see a scenario where we team up with other state agencies that might have more of a physical footprint in a lot of small communities around the state and be able to, to use their buildings and to be able to allow an unrepresented claimant without a computer to be able to go to one of those buildings and to be able to use those computers and webcams as well. There are several advantages to still offering remote hearings. And overall, I think it'll be a case by case basis in the best interest of the work comp system. Um, either way, we'll have less in person hearings. And I see our flexibility and accommodations leading to support from everyone involved. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one more question. And Libby, maybe you can take this one. Um, what can employers do to support return to the workforce? Yeah, so if you call it return to the workforce, uh, I'm assuming a lot of that is really office associates because there are so many people that are currently working in their regular space. Um, but, you know, I think that um, if you think about it now, I mean, people have been working remotely or, or maybe working differently for a year. Um, and, you know, and I think there's a benefit for a lot of people, and I think other people are struggling with this, but I think any, any return to, to office or return to workplace should probably be done in stages, and I think it should also take into account, you know, whatever safety measures need to be in place when that, when that occurs. So if you think about people going back into the workplace right now, hey, there's, there is vaccine distribution, but there are still a lot of, you know, you know, guidelines and things that need to be followed about social distancing and about wearing, you know, protection, wearing masks. Um, and even once we get to a point where there's, you know, more, you know, more people are being vaccinated, you know, I think there's still going to be some protective measures that may, will make associates and employees more comfortable. And so I think that I think COVID is a really is a really scary thing for for a lot of people, and a lot of people over the past year have had had you know losses in their family. They've had people that are sick, and I think you have to 
really understand where our employees coming from. You know, what's the background of what's happened over the past year and really be prepared to address not only just the physical workspace, but also that mental well-being piece that coming back into an office as quickly as we left it last year, you know, it's, it can't be the same process. It has to be very, you know, di diligent. It has to have over communication with, with leaders. And there also has to be a real focus on making people feel comfortable within the workspace. And, and whether that's, you know, people working in offices, maybe it's if they sit in open environments that people are spaced out, it's keeping limitations on conference rooms. Um, and it's also making sure that there's continual touch points with employees even after they get back into that workspace and getting feedback from them about how they feel about it and what makes them comfortable. Because I think to have a productive workplace, people need to feel good about it and they wanna be there. And so I think that's gonna take a, a certainly a lot of effort and communication to make that happen. Thank you, a lot of good information. Thanks, thank you each of you for participating on our panel. It was lovely to have uh, such a, a bunch of diverse perspectives on a tough issue. So I'd also like to say thank you to all of our attendees today, um, everybody for attending our conference, the virtual, going virtual instead of being in person. Um, we're thrilled that everybody can attend. It's while we missed seeing people in person, it's nice to be able to have our, our work used a little bit more broadly. If you haven't had a chance to rate the sessions yet, please do. You'll find that over on the left-hand side of your screen. There's a, um, a rate button for the session. Um, and if you have time to visit our exhibitor hall, there's some interesting raffles that are going on. And WCRI will make, be making a donation to Kids Chance for based on the number total number of visits to the exhibitor hall. So day two of our conference starts tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Um, we have a, a whole host of interesting um, sessions again. Uh, we have Dr. Jewel Mullen talking to us about uh, COVID-19 and equity. We have our state of the states that we do every year. We have some WCR research on physical therapy. And finally, we'll wrap up hearing from Dr. Howard from NIOSH. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.